The Family Ties is a true crime podcast that focuses on the cases of children that have been killed or affected by the ravages of abuse, neglect, torture, assault, starvation, or any other crimes committed against children. Every day in the U.S., between four to seven children die at the hands of parents, foster parents, or caretakers. That's an average of 2,000 children per year that die of totally preventable causes. I want to bring awareness to these crimes and uncover the effects and long-term damage that is a result of this national epidemic. I also discuss the ways that we as a country need to change the broken system that is currently in place to protect children. The Family Ties is here to give voice to the voiceless and to challenge you all to take action in your own communities to demand better protection for our most vulnerable. Listen and viewer discretion is advised due to the explicit nature of the topics we cover. Welcome back to the Family Ties podcast. Before we get started, I'd like to invite each and every one of you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, like my videos, and share your thoughts and comments with me. And for those of you listening to the podcast, please rate and subscribe wherever you find your pods. I welcome your feedback as well as your suggestions and case recommendations. So please post away. Today we're covering the case of three-year-old Olivia Jansen, who disappeared and then uh, was discovered murdered in Kansas City, Kansas in 2020. On July 10th of 2020, Howard Jansen III and his girlfriend Jacqueline Kirkpatrick reported Howard's three-year-old daughter Olivia is missing. Fox 4 News reports that in court papers, Jansen III went to Kansas City, Kansas Police Department's Midtown Patrol Division, boy is that a mouthful, <clears throat> to report Olivia's disappearance at 8.30 a.m. on July 10th. Jansen, who ironically has Olivia's name tattooed on his face, told police that he woke up around 5.30 a.m. on July 10th, 2020, and was unable to find Olivia anywhere. Fox 4 News goes on to report that Jansen told police that he had seen her sleeping on a couch at 6 p.m. the night before. When the alert went out later that Friday, investigators said that the last time he'd seen her was at 11 p.m., Thursday, when he went to sleep at his home on Gibbs Road. Jansen also told police that his back door was standing wide open when he went to look for Olivia. I'm assuming that Howard was trying to shift suspicion from him elsewhere by, you know, implying that Olivia either walked out of her own volition through the back door, you know, three years old, pretty, you know, pretty ballsy, or that she'd been kidnapped by someone. After Jansen filed the missing person report at police headquarters in Kansas City, a search was triggered that involved multiple law enforcement agencies, the aid of the canine units, and drones. Interestingly, throughout the day, Howard provided different accounts of events that didn't quite add up to law enforcement. On July 11th, 2020, after an Amber Alert was issued, the community participated in an intense search. Olivia's bruise-covered body was then found in a shallow grave, only nine hours after she'd been originally reported as missing. Investigators state that an anonymous tip led them to Olivia's body near a walking trail in the woods. I'm always curious about these anonymous tips, and I'm just grateful that there are people who do report this stuff. I wonder, you know, who saw what, you know, how much they saw, and what brought them to that area that day or night. I'm just glad that there are people who do keep an eye out and do catch these things and do report them. But little Olivia, that little baby Olivia, three years old, was found in her pajamas with severe bruising to her face, arms, and legs. And she'd also sustained several lacerations to the back of her head, which indicated that she was severely beaten to death. The autopsy found bleeding on the back of her brain, which was deemed to be the cause of her death. So to provide some clarity and a little backstory, let's go back in time a bit. Well before Olivia's murder, her grandparents and her family had reported their concerns of abuse to the Kansas Department for Children and Families asking for help. Going forward, I'm gonna call them DCF just for you know, the ease of that. But this led Howard and Jacqueline to cut off all access between Olivia and her grandparents. All the way back in June of 2020, Olivia's step-grandmother, Elizabeth Jansen, had reached out to um, the Kansas Department for Children and Families to report suspected drug abuse by Howard and Jacqueline, in addition to Howard's concerning short-fused temper. 
As far as I can uncover, DCF only talked to little Olivia on June 30th and then on July 7th of 2020. Howard Jansen was drug tested and THC was found in his system, but DCF said there wasn't sufficient evidence to justify Olivia being removed from their custody. Understandably, Olivia's family views DCF's lack of interest and action in Olivia's case as a glaring failure by protective services, especially after a DCF investigator assigned to Olivia's case seemingly gave up after a failed attempt to check in on the girl. Police and DCF were called on Olivia's behalf five times, so I'd say it's pretty safe to say the system actively failed Olivia. I personally would also like to know what they asked Olivia and how seriously they took her responses. How much can a three-year-old say or infer that an agent would see as concerning? I mean, at, my niece is two years old and, you know, she's not super great with communication. She, she talks and in her own way, but I would say to convey something that is happening to her, I, I don't know how capable a three-year-old is of, you know, describing what's going on with them. I also don't know exactly how these investigations are being conducted, but they're clearly failing. Actions and investigation uh, procedures need to be evaluated and desperately require reform. The question remains, though, why does CPS continue to put the interest of the parents above that of the child at every turn? seriously. Just ask yourselves that. If you know the answer to it and you or you work in child services and know the answers to a lot of the questions I ask, please, please comment. Please help me not be so ignorant of what's going on here. Elizabeth, the step-grandmother, told KSHB News Station that Olivia was always unhappy to go home after visits with her family. Heartbreakingly, Olivia would ask Elizabeth, you love me? You're not mad at me? I come back, I come back. At one point, Olivia even begged to live with her grandparents, which is just so sad because, you know, toddlers and little kids, they, they rely on their parents a lot. They're, they're typically not super independent and, and ready to just not be at home with their, their parents. Elizabeth Jansen also admits that they knew that Olivia was in a really bad situation, but that they didn't really know the full extent even when they were pleading with protective services. So, I mean, that goes to show there, there's definitely more to this case than I was able to find information for. So just, just know that. I, I know that there is a lot more to this than all of the articles and uh, reports that I've read. I think we're missing big chunks of this story. But of course, DCF was loath to release their case findings but they were forced to once it was determined that Olivia's death was a result of child abuse. At this time, the report regarding the investigation into Olivia's murder, it hasn't been released yet, but I'd very much like to see this 533 page case file for myself. Maybe some of my an my questions would be answered, but there's there's just a lot of gaping holes here. But let's let's discuss the reported abuse that took place. There's not a lot of information that details Howard's particular involvement in the abuse, but the fact that his own family was reporting concern to DCF regarding his anger and short temper, it seems pretty evident that he was involved in some way. Additionally, the fact that Howard pled no contest to the abuse and endangerment charges also indicate his participation in the abuse that was perpetrated against Olivia. As far as Jacqueline, Howard's girlfriend, is concerned, there's quite a, a lot of information detailing what she participated in, but uh, it's been revealed that she actively took part in the abuse. She would lock little Olivia in a dog kennel. She would physically harm Olivia in front of others and was often known to force Olivia to stand for long periods of time in a corner. Other children in the Jansen household corroborated to authorities that Jacqueline would hit Olivia on the back of the head as well as shove her or her head into walls. Seems like Jacqueline has a lot of anger issues and um, thinks that picking on a three-year-old versus someone her size is, is fulfilling her in some way. Uh, unbelievable. And you know, one other thing here I just thought of is I don't know exactly how many other children are in this household and what their ages are, but you know, they've clearly come forward to corroborate that these parents were really abusive. But you know, if these kids are Jacqueline's biological kids, which I think, I think there was something I read that indicated that they were, it's interesting to find out 
if they had been abused as well, I mean, we just know that they've corroborated her treatment of Olivia. Was she just singling Olivia out since Olivia was not her biological daughter? This is something that tends to happen quite often in these abuse and uh, murder charges when there is someone who is not a biological parent involved in the, the murder. So just, just another thing that I may never have the answer to. During court proceedings at the Wyandotte County Courthouse, some of Olivia's family read aloud victim impact statements and emotions were running very high. At one point, the courtroom had to be cleared because of the outpouring of emotions. Olivia Jansen's uh, biological grandmother, Vicki Sandin, said, I just want everyone to remember her for what she was. She was a precious baby. She was happy and full of joy. I just ask everyone to remember her for who she is and not the people who took her life away from us. So then, as far as charges are concerned, last year on November 3rd, 2021, Jacqueline pleaded guilty to one count of second-degree murder, one count of child abuse under the age of six, and two counts of interference in regards to the investigation of Olivia's death. On December 20th of last year, Jacqueline was then sentenced to 31 years in prison for her role in Olivia's abuse and death. In her original plea deal, Kirkpatrick agreed to testify in the trial of Olivia's father, Howard John Jansen the thir third. So I'm sure there will be a lot of finger pointing going on back and forth between those two. But initially, Jansen was charged with first degree murder, but the charge was reduced to second degree murder, and he accepted his own plea deal, the details of which I'm not completely certain of, but I'm sure it involves, you know, testifying in uh, Jacqueline's case, you know, against her. On March 25th of this year, though, Jansen was charged, Jansen III, sorry, I keep forgetting that, was charged with second degree murder, abuse of a child, three counts of aggravated endangerment of a child, and interference with law enforcement. Howard Jansen III was sentenced to 29 years of prison time. But it's unclear whether Jacqueline or Howard was determined to be the one to have dealt the murderous blows. But considering both individuals' past behavior and the fact that abuse was committed by both, it really could go either way. Like I said, there's not a lot about these cases that I cover. There's not a lot of information. There's a lot of stuff that I think we may never know. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they're underage children involved in this. And I think there are different statutes for what can be released about these cases. But, you know, clearly there's there's a lot of holes in this story. Like, I don't know how, what happened in between the 10th and the 11th before the search was even conducted. I would just, I would love to be a fly on the wall to, to report on a lot of these things. But I have to apologize that I don't always have the most information to provide you all with. And that just comes down to the fact that there's just not a lot released on these cases for multiple varying reasons. But I don't know at what point the court documents of the the case files will be um, released to the public. I don't know the legalities of that or how long they wait to release those. But I have a feeling that it's not going to really satisfactorily answer a lot of the questions that I have. But, you know, regardless, this is just another instance where we need to pay attention and we need to act upon that. I want to thank you guys for joining me for today's uh, episode. I urge you all to donate or join local causes in your communities that are working to fight for better rights for children. If you don't know where to start, visit our website and find some resources there. You can click on the donate page where I've provided links to some of my favorite child advocacy programs, such as ENDCAN, which is End Child Abuse Now, and the Coalition for Responsible Home Education. It's all of our responsibilities to stand up for the rights and lives of children everywhere. This is a fight that has nothing to do with partisan politics, simply the right for all children to be safe, loved, and cared for. So let's get moving. Let's get organized. Thank you and join the family.